In this part, we're going to be taking a look at how we can move between the sub level and the cup context as seamlessly as possible. So to begin with, we can go ahead and just drop a SOP network. Same thing as dropping a geometry node, we're just treating this as a container. So this over here can just be our grass network. And inside of here, we're just going to place a cop net. So the usual cop net that we've placed before. So this one over here, we can rename to grass and then dive inside. Now, currently we are in the cop context or Copernicus context. And to add to our knowledge from the previous part, we're going to be creating a new SOP import at this level and using it to generate points to scatter. And then we can use those to generate blades of grass. But I want to show you something that's quite interesting. So if we go over here and just create a fractal noise. So we've used this already. It's just a fractal noise. We already established that if you use something like a transform on it, that this is perfectly seamless and tileable. So knowing that we could use this to scatter points. And if we scatter points, then following the logic that this is seamless and tileable, our points should be seamless and tileable too. So let's go ahead and try that. But how exactly would we do that? Well, what we can do is just drop a null. And this is going to be a null that we can use just for referencing. So we can call this density. And then just beneath us over here, we can create a sop import, right? So sop import right over here. And this is where we're going to be fetching our points from. So we can call this points. And inside of the sop import, we can go ahead and drop a grid. We're going to be making it a two by two and we won't transform it just yet. There's no need. And from this, we can use a scatter. We take the scatter and over here where we have by density, we also have in texture space. Now you will see that it requires a density texture and a UV attribute. However, our points won't have a UV attribute. Couldn't find texture attribute UV for mapping from texture space to geometry. So that means that we have to create a UV space before going into our scatter. So we can use a UV project right over here. We can initialize it and this will create this grid for us. And then on the scatter over here, just activate the density texture. Now the texture that we want is actually this over here, right? We want that as our texture. So all we have to do, control C, dive inside. And over here, we can just use op, so OP, colon, paste the path to that node. Now it might not be obvious, but if we increase our density scale, you'll be able to see that this is actually utilizing a noise pattern to generate our density. And how do we know this? Well, we can make some changes to this over here so it's more obvious. Let's just increase the size, increase the amplitude. And so now you can see that we should have these two empty spaces or low density areas on the left and right. So let's go back in here and see if that's the case. And that's exactly the case. On the right hand side, there is a lower density. On the left hand side, there's a lower density as well. So now that we have our points scattered like this, let's go ahead and add some other attributes to it. Things like orientation and P scale, because what we want is to actually copy blades of grass to each of these points and have their orientation driven by things that exist outside of this network. So we can make more noises over here. We can make one for orientation and one for P scale, whatever we want, right? So I'm going to keep it simple and just make one for orientation. So we can duplicate these two nodes. Alt, click and drag. And this fractal noise, we will turn it into a UV. Let's just decrease the element size slightly, offset it, and we'll turn it into a 3D noise. And this makes it animated so that if we play this back in our timeline, you'll see that it transforms over time or evolves over time. We can also reduce the roughness on this. And this over here is going to be for our orientation of our grass. So now we can rename this over here to just direction. So now we have a density and a direction. So let's feed our direction into our SOP import as well. How are we going to do this one? Because this one, we won't be doing this density texture as we've done over here, but instead we can do something with an attribute map. So attribute from map right over here. And into the first input, we'll take our points. By default, it'll just fetch this value over here from a default texture that it has over here. Now, there's a couple of ways that we can do this, but I'm going to use a cop net over here. And on this cop net, we can actually use an external cop and direct it to that path, right? So direct it to direction. And all it'll do is now import it. So you can see that we're actually bringing it in from outside here into here. Now that we have this cop net, we can plug this into our attribute from map and it won't work yet. What we have to do is change the map source to a volume and it still won't work. And that's because this cop net, if we middle mouse on this, you'll see that this has no name, right? So volumes generally have names such as density or temperature or whatever it may be. You'll often name your volumes. So we can go ahead and add a name. So a name node right over here. And all we're going to do is give this a name called DIR or direction. 
if we middle mouse on this, you'll now see that we have a volume called DIR. All right, so on here, all we have to do is change the volume name to DIR. Now it'll fetch it from this copnet. So you'll see we have this, and it's now fetching it over here. Cool, so that's also working. Now we don't actually want to export the attribute as a CD attribute, we don't want it as color, we'll just store it in a value called DIR as well. And just to avoid confusion, the volume name coming in is DIR, and the attribute that we were exporting was CD, but I've changed it to DIR as well. So now there's an attribute on our points called DIR, and we won't visualize it, so this is now what we have, but it now does contain this DIR attribute. So how are we going to be using that DIR? Well, we want to use it for orientation. So what we can do is create a scatter and align. And usually with scatter and align, you would use it to actually scatter points onto a geometry surface. But in this case, we can use the second input. And if you change the mode to add attributes to existing point cloud, you can use it for generating orientations. Now, the only thing that we're going to do on here is go down to alignment, and the target forward vector is going to be an attribute of our choosing, and we're going to choose DIR. So now it's going to be generating orientation attributes based on this DIR that we're bringing in, right? This direction value. As for P scale, we can go over here and just deactivate it. We don't want P scale right now. We just want to work with an orient attribute. So if we middle mouse now, you'll see that we have DIR. That's what we used. We have N that's been generated by our scatter and align. We have orient P, a tag, and UVs. So if we go up a level, right now and set our display flag on our points, we can now make use of these. But you will notice that this is oriented incorrectly. So we just want to rotate this up. So use a transform node, rotated 90 on the x-axis. That's going to set it up like that. And then we can use a stamp point. Now stamp point is the node that's going to be used for copying a bunch of images or stamps to a bunch of points. So we feed it our points and you'll just see this white square. And that's simply because each one of the stamps that are being copied to these points are too big. So under clipping, we can adjust the scale, dropping it down until we can see what we have, right? So we end up with a bunch of these little squares making this up. We can also reduce the number of points that we're scattering over here by decreasing the density scale, something like that. And now it'll be easier to see. Now, because our orient attribute is animated, if we play this back, you'll see that each one of these stamped points actually rotate over time, right? So a noise pattern actually distorts them over time. And this is a good starting point because from here we can add a stamp and the stamp that we'll add will be a blade of grass, right? But before we get there, let's first see if this is tileable. So if we use a transform node over here, grabbing the stamp and then transforming this down using our uniform scale, you'll notice that there are seams to this. And the fix for this is fairly simple. All we're going to do is go back inside of here and we're going to make some copies of these so that we're tiling it at this level. And one of the ways that we can do this is by using a copy to points. And what we're going to copy are our points, right? We're gonna duplicate them over. So we put that into first input because that's what we want to copy. And what we're going to copy it onto is just a grid. So we're gonna create a grid over here, setting it upright onto the X, Y plane. We're going to give it three rows and three columns with a size of four by four. So this is very similar to what we did before where we used the copy transforms. But now, if we plug this in over here, you'll see that it duplicates these over. And because our density is controlled by a tileable noise, you'll see that there's no seams over here. But if we were to change that and do this by density, you'll actually see that there's these lines of overlap. But because we're using texture space, we end up with a seamless scatter. Now, if we go up a level and you don't see anything over here, then it's safe to assume that what's happened is we've copied these the wrong way around. Because orientation is important for how these are viewed, it could be that we're copying these with the orientations facing in the wrong direction. So an easy solution for this is on your grid over here, just rotate it on the y-axis by 180 degrees. So that'll flip it around. And now we should see our stamp. And interestingly enough, if we use a transform over here and then transform this down, it is now tiled. So it's incredibly difficult to notice a seam at this point. And so this is working quite well. Now, the great thing about how we've done this is that if we make changes to these two noise up here, our density and our direction, you'll be able to see these changes directly in our stamp points. So if we change our density over here to a smaller element size, it'll readjust our scatter. And if we make changes to our fractal noise over here, it'll change the orientations. And so this is currently working quite well. So now we're going to take a look at how we can work with SDFs to create particular shapes to feed into our stamp point. Okay, so we've got this working, but now we want to create some shapes to feed in as grass. The thing that we're going to be using for this is the SDF shape. 
So down here, we can create an SDF shape. And it may seem strange what we're creating over here, but all it is is a signed distance field. So that white line over there represents the surface of the sphere. The gray represents outside. The orange represents inside. So the great thing about working with SDFs is that we can convert them to either mono or RGB. And if we go SDF to RGB, then you can create all sorts of effects straight from this. For example, if we go over here, we can invert it and then do shadowing. And this is a really decent way of creating gradients. We can adjust the ISO value, or we can even end up with just a thin line or a ring like this if we use onion skin. So there's massive potential just using the SDF shape with the SDF to RGB or SDF to mono. So over here, we can change this to a compound shape. And these are shapes that are made up of more than one SDF. We're going to use the vesica right over here, reduce the roundness slightly. Then we can rotate this so that it's facing up and then translate it down slightly so that what we end up with is something like a flat base for our grass blade. Now we can go SDF to mono. So SDF to mono right over here. That will convert it into this. And this doesn't look like a blade of grass just yet. So what we're going to do is use a gradient. So we can use a ramp, ramp mono right over here. And then let's just adjust this ramp so that we have a line in the middle. So I'll extend this down, position of 0 0.5, then complement the ramp and lift up that middle value, something like that. Now we can multiply this with our original piece of grass. So now we have that line running down the middle and you can make changes to this to narrow that in. Additionally, you may want the base to be darker as well. So we can make another ramp. This one we can set to vertical and already that should be decent enough to multiply. There we go. Now, another thing that might be nice to do is just a transform so that we can make this blade of grass a bit thinner. And if you don't want this repeating like this, just change the border to clamp. That'll make sure that we have a single blade of grass. Okay, so we can move this all over to the side here. And the last thing we're going to do is just a distort. So we're going to distort this blade of grass with a noise. So we'll take a fractal, fractal noise set to UV, put that into the direction, push up the scale, and then make some adjustments to this fractal noise. Okay, so now if we take this and plug it into our stamp over here, we can see what we have. We just have these tiny blades of grass. We can increase their scale over here until they look a bit better, but you will notice something strange about how they actually rotate. It may not be obvious, but a lot of them are rotating from their midpoint. And that's simply because the pivot for these when we put them in as stamps is going to be the center. So you can actually think of it as pivoting around this area over here. And that's not what we want for a blade of grass. So what we're going to do is transform this up. So use a transform 2D and we're just going to move this up. So translate up. So somewhere about there should be decent. Now they should rotate a bit more reasonably. We can also make other changes to this. For example, if we don't want them so thin, we can make them a bit thicker, just like that. And now it's starting to come together. Now, one thing that will help the look of the stamp over here is to go down to the bottom and change the blend method to maximum. This will make it seem as if they are overlapping in some way. And I just think that the look that that gives is a lot more interesting than what we had. So all of the instancing attributes that we actually use inside of Houdini still apply to this over here. So we can make changes to the points that are coming in before we copy them. And we'll end up with much more interesting results. For example, we could add things like P scale. So we could go over here at P scale equals rand at PT num. And then we can make sure that it fits to a certain range. So we can do a fit zero one on this and make sure that it ranges between, let's say 0 0.5 and one. If we go to our copied points, go up a level, you'll see that we now have some smaller blades of grass. You can also do things with color. And an interesting way to do that is also to just use a noise over here. So we take this, we duplicate it. We'll call this null color. We'll use a noise for this. We'll set this to Perlin, then we'll do a ramp, ramp RGB, taking the position and then giving this some values. So just like that, dive back inside the SOP import and we'll do the same thing that we did here with the copnet. So we'll create a copnet. We'll tell it that we want to use an external one, grabbing color, giving it a name. We can just give this volume any name. So CLR is fine. Then use an attribute from map, plug it in before our scout and align, plug this in over here. And then we're just going to switch this to volume, changing the volume name to CLR. Now each one of our points is fetching that color. And if we go up a level, and now if we go back over here to our stamp points, you won't notice any difference. And that's because we need to change the signature over here to RGB, because we now have a color being brought in. Now we can very easily go ahead, increase the scatter count if we want, and all of that still works. The last thing that I'm going to show you is just 
the few things that get output from our stamp point. Firstly, we have our stamp, and that's basically just an image. So if we take a look at it, that's what's being visualized at the moment. But we also have an ID that's going to be unique per point. And then we also have UVs. And I'll be showing you how to use these UVs for interesting effects when we look at the tiling tutorials. But for now, we can just stick to stamp and ID. And the way that you would use ID is that you could use a random mono, so random mono or random RGB. This gives you a random value per ID if we plug this into the seed, just like that. And then you can use this for a variety of things. So we can put that into a ramp. We can take this and very easily use it as a multiplier. For example, if we didn't actually have color on this, we could very easily do that as well. So if we don't have this color coming in, so all of our stamped points are just grayscale, then we can take this and actually generate our color afterwards by using it with a multiply. So we take our stamp into the background, multiply it over here with the color, and we get that. Right, so now we can actually change our color over here instead of through the noise pattern. And of course, you can still do both. That is also an option. From here, we do still have all of the existing options for working with this. For example, we could generate something that resembles an alpha mask. If we use the ID over here, we can use ID to mask. If we go over here and say keep by range, we can change the start ID, so activated, setting it to zero. And over here, under the range filter, we'll say select one of one. That'll select everything except our background, and we can now use this as a mask. You can also blur it if you need, if these edges are too sharp. But once you have that, you can do things like creating a background. So if we just use a fractal noise, feeding it into a ramp, so RGB ramp, something like that. We can then use a maximum operation, feeding in these two over here, as well as the mask, and then just making an adjustment to the mask so that it's inverted. We can then work on the background separately. And then simply increasing our point count is a decent idea. So on our scatter, increasing this density scale will end up with much more grass. You still have the option of taking this grass over here and using the luminosity. So we can take this and do a two mono. So we'll go RGB to mono, using that for a height to ambient occlusion, increasing the height scale, and then using this with whatever blend method we want. So let's use a blend and see what works. So we'll take this and our occlusion, And that seems to give an interesting result. So there we have it. The only other thing that I would recommend taking a look at is over here on our stamp points, we can actually stamp more than one type of image. So if we increase the number of stamps to something like two, we could feed in another image over here. So I'm just going to make a blade of grass that's distorted in a different way. One like that. Plug that into the second stamp. And by default, that won't do anything simply because we need to tell it which stamp to use. And we do that using an attribute. So the easiest way to do this is just to say i at stamp equals rand at pt num, give it a random seed value. We take a look over here, all of our stamp values will be zero. But if we add a round to integer, so rint over here, then that'll give us values between zero and one. Now if we go up a level using that i at stamp attribute, we'll cause it to randomly use one or the other. And one way of testing this is to just replace this bottom one over here with some other shape. So let's just use a new SDF shape, SDF mono, and use this as the second option. So the second stamp option over here. And you'll see that it switches between these spheres and the blades of grass. Right, so that's how you do it. You just use this attribute, I at stamp, and then you can use this over here to randomly get a value between zero and one for each point. And then each one will have a random one of the stamps copied. If you have more than two stamps, then you're going to have to get a bit more creative with this, but you can just multiply this value, so this random number over here, by the number of stamps that you're looking for, minus one. So if we're looking for three stamps, then we'll just multiply this by two. If we take a look now, you'll see that stamp ranges from zero to two. So zero, one, two. Cool, so that's all for this tutorial. I do hope that this helped you understand stamping. There's a lot of interesting things that you can do with this, so feel free to get creative. Mixing this with the other organic methods that I showed you in the previous part, will yield some really interesting results. Keeping in mind that this one that we've created is also tileable, simply because of the methods shown earlier on. And just a huge thank you to Scott Keating. He helped me out a huge deal by showing me some of his files in which he did many of the methods that I've shown you here, especially things like the tiling, which didn't come as intuitively to me. He really helped with things like that. So again, big shout out to Scott Keating for all of his assistance with these videos.
So if you're interested in learning more, head over to the tiling series where I'll show you how to create a bunch of different tile type textures and how to do things like warping UV space and all sorts of crazier effects. So I'll see you there.